We are moving into the last keynote. Woo! Cheer for that. Don't forget to rate the panel. Don't forget to rate the panel. I want to know what you think. All right, so I'm really excited about the next panel. Uh, this is super, super exciting. I'm going to be bringing onto the stage the co-founder of a company called Kabam. Um, and like Danae and a couple other people like um, Julia Hartz, some of these people who have been around the Women 2.0 community from day one, Holly too has been around when we were hosting events literally in our own apartments. And I think she might have come into one of them at some point. Um, and it's just so a delight to see her run this company, uh, make it profitable in a time where other companies in this space are just not making it. Uh, and I'm talking about the gaming industry. So it's pretty exciting to bring Holly onto the stage. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about her. So she is the co-founder and chief of staff at Kabam. Has anyone, does anyone play games on Kabam? I'm curious. Uh, some little hand went up. Oh, don't tell anyone. Uh, so they are the, the leader in the Western world for, well, I mean, she didn't want to tell anyone. That's what I meant. Um, for free to play core games. So these are not casual games. These are the hardcore games that people play. She also um, oversees Kabam's corporate culture and talent, responsible for driving Kabam's vision, mission, and values of more than 800 employees, which is amazing to think about um, considering, yeah, 800 employees is a lot of people. Um, she's helped to grow the company by over 500%. That's also very impressive. So prior to overseeing talent, she was in charge of the product design for their flagship franchise, Kingdoms of Camelot, um, and she was recently named Fortune's 100, uh, sorry, Fortune's 10 Most Powerful Women in Gaming and Forbes' 10 Most wim Powerful Women Entrepreneurs to Watch. Kabam's revenues have grown from nothing to 360 million in four years. <laughs> Does, did you understand what I just said? <laughs> revenues. 360 million in four years. That's mind boggling. Um, when she told me this on the phone, I almost dropped my phone because I was like, what? Um, so, and they have grown every year, year over year. And of course, of course, they were named fastest growing internet media company in the Bay Area. And they are now fa growing faster than, have grown faster than Facebook and Yelp. I bet you didn't know that. She will share her story about founding and finding her success with Gabam and what it's like to go big so you don't have to go home. I love that title. Holly, I'm so excited. Please come to the stage. Kill it, girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, the clicker, sorry. Oh, OK. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here and braving it to the very bitter end of this wonderful conference. I will say I can't think of a better place to be on Valentine's Day with so many women and some men out there who love tech and are passionate about it. It's been so energetic and energizing. So before I start, I actually have a small confession to make. I was driving up and I was rather nervous today. And it's not because public speaking is the number one fear of Americans. It was because I realized eight years ago, as Shahiro has said, um, I helped host uh, the first meetup or like their first conference. And here I am eight years later, able to share the story with you with the exact company that helped inspire me to do this. So I hope you guys are proud and it's such an honor. So I'm gonna start with a question. When you guys see this phrase or hear this phrase, what do you think? What do you picture when you hear go big or go home? For me, I picture a baseball stadium that is just packed to capacity. The crowds are cheering, the stadium lights are on, and on the field is just this lone batter waiting for the pitch so that he could swing for the fences and get that home run and not strike out. After eight years of founding Kabam, going big looked very different at different stages of the company. However, I believe that the secret to going big is rather simple, but not easy. It's actually the commitment to go big. It's finding that one thing and giving everything you got and making sure you don't leave till it's done. It's just like that batter who left everything on the field so that when he swung for the fences, he knew he did everything in, that power, in his power to make sure that that hit was a home run. So I'm gonna talk about Kabam in three stages and what it's like to go big. 
The first stage is really the similar stages to any kind of company or startup, which is really laying the foundation, the initial stages of it. The second is building the house. What happens when you start dumping a lot of people in and more and more people? What does going big look like there? And number three, uh, what's the future like for Kabam? What's it gonna be like to invite the world in? And finally, what does going big mean for you? What does that look like? Going big is one thing, but the commitment to execute against it is another. So how many of you have started your own company or are starting your own? Okay, so you guys will be able to relate to this part. It's exciting, it's exhilarating, it's enthralling, but it is also full of a lot of hard work, right? It's not glamorous at all. You guys are probably cleaning your own toilets, um, and really, it's full of some really tough decisions. Um, so my decision to go big actually started before Kabam had even started. Um, I had been working at AOL for three years as a product designer, and I love the design team. I was working on our community products, and um, the thing with big companies is it kind of takes some time to do things. Stakeholders, there's a lot of people involved. And when you're a creative, the secret is, is if you don't give creatives a ton of work, they will actually start creating work for themselves. So I had a ton of side projects, and this was one of them. This is what I like to call the mouse house. I had a lot of problems running from meetings to meetings. My mouse would fall off the keyboard. And so I slapped some Velcro on it, and voila, a mouse house. And yeah, this was like many of my side projects, just testing out ideas, having some fun, prototyping. Well, there was a special side project that I had for a corporate social networking site, which I'll go into a little bit later. This one was special because we had two engineers and a business dude that I recruited. We would spend some time you know, working on it on the weekends and sometimes in the evenings. And I treated it just like any one of my other side projects. I'm like, maybe there'll be some traction, and if there is, let's see. Uh, let's finish prototyping first, and, and we'll find out. The business dude, he had very different ideas. He started looking for a seed round of funding. And one night, he gives me a call, and he goes, Holly, I need you to leave AOL. I was thinking, what? We don't have any product. All we had were some mocks, some cool conversations, and not much else. On top of that, I had just gotten married a few months ago, so somehow I was gonna have to explain to my husband that I was gonna work for this new currency called sweat equity. And don't <laughs> worry, it was, it was gonna be big. Just hold tight. And um, I remember he said to me, he goes, Holly, look, these investors are ready to put their money into this. And they need to know if the founding team is gonna be all in. They need to know if we have skin in the game. And then secondly, he told me, you know, Holly, I can't think of a company that's gone big and grown successfully without at some point the founders quitting and dedicating 120% to this thing. So I'm gonna need you to quit all of your other side projects. And I think that part was a bit more painful for me. I started thinking about that. I went home and the one thing I asked myself was, was I gonna regret this? Was this gonna be something I was gonna regret? And I realized, yeah, I could go through life with a bunch of side projects and never have any fruition, just some dreams and going there. And I realized I was gonna regret that. So with that, um, I decided that this was the thing I was gonna go big on. I was gonna go all in on it and make sure I could do everything in my power to make sure that this product was gonna be a success. So I left AOL, which meant I left their wonderful espresso machines, <laughs> an awesome workspace called the Cube, and a great design team. They were really awesome. And I traded it in for this. Some, yeah, some overpriced coffee, a bridge table for my cube, and I had to do my own janitorial services. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And then we also traded it in for this. A big box of cup of noodles. Um, we committed to that and made sure that we finished it. That is um, my co-founder, Mike Lee, our technical co-founder, and I'll talk about him a little bit more later. So very quickly at this stage, I learned it was 95% execution. That's what we learned. I think you guys are all learning that as well. We also learned that it was 5% idea. So oftentimes people will see this in the valley and they'll say, you know, it's all about execution and your ideas are just useless. I actually beg to differ because I think what they do not tell you is you need 100% just for a shot at success. 
right? You need 100%. And I'll talk about that 5% idea later and how incredibly important that is. But first, let's talk about that 95% execution. At the heart of it is finding the right co-founding team. And don't worry, guys, I even have a formula for that. <laughs> finding the right co-founding team is 15% skill set and 85% fit, fit, fit. Very important. Since both of them are incredibly important, let's start with the 15% skill. I subscribe to the 500 startups idea and methodology around how you need a hacker, a hustler, and a designer, particularly if you're gonna do something web as well as mobile. You must have all three, yeah? And more importantly, you must know who's on point for what. And what is incredibly mandatory is to have a mutual deep respect for one another and in their discipline and be committed to that. Um, before I started Kabam, I used to work with Mike Lee a lot on a lot of different side projects. That's how we got to know each other. And we used to have this raging debate, which we don't have anymore because um, the ups and downs of Kabam has really killed it all. <laughs> um, but the raging debate went like this. He was an engineer and he said, look, Holly, I am the most important. I can build it. I don't need any of you. I said, don't worry, engineers, you guys are incredibly important. But this is what I would say to him. I'd say, well, that's good. You can build it, but do you want it to be successful and usable? And, and I'd say, it's kind of like building a door, but without any doorknobs. So I'm pretty important as a designer. And then the business dude would come up to us and say, you guys are both silly. He's like, you guys are going nowhere. It's just a bunch of side projects. So you guys build this beautiful house. No one can find it. No one can visit it. Therefore, no one's going to pay for it. You guys are just wasting your time. And we realized through the ups and downs that all three were incredibly important. And all three of us needed to have this mutual respect and commit to that. So the more important piece of it, um, but both equally important, is the 85% fit, fit, fit. So what does that mean? Same values, right? Danae had to talk a bit about what do the same values look like. Commitment. Are you guys at the same commitment levels? Are some of you half on the project, treating it like a side project, or are some of you all in? My hope is your whole co-founding team is all in. Your working style. You guys are gonna get into some really, really stupid fights. You guys might have already gotten into them already. And somehow they become and they escalate into large uh, religious wars. Uh, okay, so I know some people have already done this. <laughs> I've gotten into this. You guys have to be able to resolve this and resolve your personality differences, right? And despite all that, you guys still need to enjoy spending time together because you guys will be spending a lot of time together. They're gonna see you at your best and at your very worst. And when I look at this, what does this look like? This looks like a lot of the same advice that I would give to anybody who's thinking of a lifelong commitment <laughs> or partnership. And that would be the same exact advice I would give to anybody when they're putting together that co-founding team, is treat it as seriously with a ton of due diligence as you would marriage. Um, how many people know on average, who knows on average it takes uh, for a company to go IPO? How many years? Yeah, it takes about seven to eight years. But you know what, that's not the end game, right? The end game is to build a sustainable business. So you're going to have to think beyond eight years. You're going to be with these people eight years plus. So just think about that when you're, doing your, when you're pulling together your team. So let's review the shot of success, this formula. At, it's 95% execution. At the heart of it is the right co-founding team. That's 15% skill, 85% fit. Now let's talk about that little minuscule 5% idea, which is incredibly important. So before I get into how amazing our idea was, let me first at least paint a landscape of what the world was like in 2006 before we started the company. So Web 2.0 was really hot. Do you guys remember those juicy badges? It was like all of a sudden it, it was approved, stamp of approval. Uh, YouTube had just been sold to Google for $1.2 billion. We're like, whoa, that's amazing. Um, tag clouds were really big. This was representative of user-generated content, right? Users were now participating. And then, I don't know if you guys know this, but there was this book called The Clue Train Manifesto that I really loved. And it talked a lot about how there was this movement that was going on in the web, 
where creators could become publishers, consumers can now talk to the creators, and the web was gonna become a conversation. It was democratizing. The web was being democratized. And we looked at this and we thought, oh my God, if it's happening in the web, it's gonna happen in the workplace. Yeah. Managers are gonna wanna know exactly what their employees are saying and thinking, and employees are gonna wanna tell their managers exactly what they're thinking and saying. You can see how this idea is incredibly important, but maybe not such a good idea, right? But we were dumb and naive. There weren't any incubators at the time to pull us back or even pitch competitions to let us know that like, hey, this idea may be like really, really stupid. Instead, we decided to do it ourselves. So we launched the product, and we did the whole uh, marketing strategy that was normal at the time, which we emailed our friends and family with the hope that they would email their friends and family, and that you know it would just be this viral thing, and then we'd get covered in TechCrunch, and you know, whoa, you know, everybody would be knocking at our door. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got crickets. Uh, there was there was just nothing. Some friends and family that we had, we, we didn't have really. Um, so we redesigned the product about two or three more times. Um, at the same time, we changed our marketing tactics and strategies. We, we tried partnerships, we tried exchanging lists, we even tried cold calling, and still there were crickets. So um, we decided to do one last thing. It was our last resort, it was PR. Now PR is incredibly wonderful for throwing fuel onto a flame, um, and we were hoping that it would be the lighter fluid to this, that it would get the flames going and really big and start something. So we decided to go big and go all in and get that same woman who helped make Facebook a household name. We we're trying to sell it to her saying, hey, it's Facebook for companies. We tried to give her as much money as possible, everything that we could. And after several times of saying no, she still said no. And the door <laughs> was just firmly shut. And I remember just feeling like my heart sank. I was completely dejected didn't know what we were gonna do. And in fact, we started talking about going home. That maybe it was time for us to maybe return the money to our investors. Maybe we could sell it to that one customer last week who logged in and said it was great. <laughs> and we, were, we, were, we were thinking like, you know, maybe this is just the end and we just weren't meant to be. And then something happened. Facebook launched its developer platform in 2007. And it had the one thing that we did not. It had users and a lot of them. And we decided to go into a room and talk about, should we go home or should we go big on this thing that um, wasn't clear on how it monetized, but what was very clear is that they had users. And we decided, you know what? I think we're gonna go big. So we went all in. We cleaned the whiteboard, we started with a new slate. Not a clean slate, a new slate. We took all of our learnings from the failed corporate social networking site and put it into there. The first thing is we had to hit people's passion points. That was one thing. People were not that excited to find a site to connect with their other coworkers. It just wasn't driving. Um, so we wanted to find people's passion points. The second was our team capabilities. Right? Um, our backgrounds were consumer backgrounds, and we didn't really have an enterprise background, so we couldn't figure out how to learn um, cold calling as fast and, and get that going. And then the third was really what were our passion points. And we ended up with fan communities and TV shows and eventually sports teams. At its peak, it had 60 million users. And when ABC wanted to distribute their video on Facebook, they didn't call Facebook, they called us. And I truly believe that the reason for the success of our fan communities was really because of that one decision to not go home. It was that decision to go big and commit to it even though that committing to it was not very glamorous. However, when we achieved success, it was oh so worth it. So the second stage, building the house. What does it look like to scale and dump more people in? As I said before, going big is one thing, deciding to go big, but committing to it looks very different. And at this stage, going big meant threading the needle very carefully. So um, I had mentioned that fan, our fan communities had a peak. <laughs> that meant that there was probably a bit of a downhill, and that's this side of the story. Um, so our Facebook was a startup themselves, and they loved to play around and change the navigation. So they kept changing things on the platform, which really um, affected our usage. People couldn't find us, they couldn't come back, and we had an advertising revenue model. So, that means if we didn't have the eyeballs, advertisers couldn't pay. 
On top of that, 2008 was a doozy. Um, it was the mortgage crisis. I think you heard from Julia, it was probably the worst year in the world to, to raise any capital or find anything. And um, that meant our advertising model had dried up. Um, we even had a partner who was dedicated or who had committed to $3 million in revenue and they ended up pulling out. So once again, we were back uh, in the room, the leadership team, and we we're thinking, wow, what are we gonna do? We see our, our community is kind of going down like this. We had, we had already redesigned this thing like, I don't know, 10 times. We had more time to figure this thing out. But Facebook kept changing their platform. We also were thinking, you know, which way, what, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna go big around? Should we go big or should we just go home? And we decided um, to look around again. And this time we looked at what, was go what opportunities out there was gonna be recession proof. Uh, we're in the middle of recession. Second was, again, our team capabilities. And third, what were our passion points? And we looked around and gaming on Facebook was really big. Games in general are recession proof. Mm -hmm. People love to play games. Um, it's an outlet for them. It's also for us a place to connect and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. The second thing is on Facebook, we were one of the best companies or teams to have already been creating a lot of Facebook applications. So we knew how to, how to use that. And then third was really team passion points, right? So what were the passion points? Yeah, we were super passionate around gaming. Our CEO was an avid gamer. So again, I say the decision to go big was made. However, executing against that was threading the needle. We had about 30 people who had already joined on the premise that we were fan communities, right? On top of that, we had just closed a Series B that was predicated on that as well. Um, so how are we gonna execute against this? And we also had a couple of leftover partners that we had to serve in our fan communities. What we did is we took a small team, broke them off, and had them concentrating on, on building this game. Kingdoms of Camelot, which uh, Shah Rose had talked about. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with this type of strategy-based game, it's definitely a deeper gameplay. The whole object is, is you're, you're raising your resources to build these buildings, and these buildings um, end up trading troops in these buildings, and then you could go out and attack and build alliances. It's, it's really a deeper gameplay and really a lot of fun. Um, as, it as it got a bit closer and closer to launch, we ended up um, uh, we ended up throwing more people on it, and I was in charge of the design, making it fun and accessible. Yeah. And uh, I decided, because we didn't have a lot of money and I needed to do a user testing, to call my friends and family, offer them beer and pizza, and they came. And you think your friends and family are gonna be nice? <laughs> They're not. Well, at least my friends and family were. They didn't pull back any punches. They said it. They hated it. It was the ugliest thing. They would never play. It's no fun. I can't even use this. I don't even know what I'm doing. And I was thinking, oh my God, this has got to be the worst user testing I'd ever been in. <laughs> and I told the CEO later, I said, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I would have rather stood in line at the DMV than to go to that in the end. Yeah, it was that bad. And he turned to me and he said, you see where the metrics are going, Holly, on the communities? You know we have to go all in on this. And he was right. We had to go all in. And um, so I tweaked what I could. Uh, we changed what we could. And we went all in. We marketed it to the fan communities, um, and we told our friends and family about it. And it became a success. It became a success on several dimensions. The first, it became a success because it ushered in a disruption for the gaming industry. It was what we call free-to-play or freemium model. So you could play for free, but then if you wanted to speed up your building, you would pay for it. What was the beauty about this is now I could see what people were doing. I could co-create the game with the players. The second thing it was a success is it was actually changing people's lives. I know that gaming gets kind of knocked here and there, but this game um, was very special. And a lot of our games are very special this way. There are strangers that I've met and have become friends for life. Marriages, is ha marriages have happened, as well as a ton of meetups outside. My husband was playing the game. Yeah, he ended up getting over how ugly it was and he, he decided to play the game. And he told me one time that his, in his alliance, there was this woman who struggled with sarcoidosis. I kid you not. It, I know it sounds like something from house, a house diagnosis, but it's something that's really debilitating. And she was a shut-in. And she told them, you guys are the only ones that I can really connect to in the world. You guys are my outlet. And third, it, be, it was a really, it made a lot of money. Today, it has grossed over $250 million in revenue in its lifetime. Yeah, 
it's an amazing game, what it, what it does for the people that play it and the players and enables them to do. So let's fast forward to a 400 people, um, four countries around the world. It's 2011 and Facebook has just imposed a 30% tax. So for those of you who don't know, um, Facebook, when they launched their developer platform, they had promised that they would never um, tax us. <laughs> and that just didn't happen. Um, yeah, and, and for us, the way we acquired users um, and players, it really, we believed was gonna change our business unit economics. So once again, we're sitting in a room, the leadership team, and talking about, is it time to do something about this? Is this, how much is this gonna affect us? And we truly believe that it was. But this time, and so we decided that we were gonna go big on it and say, you know what, we're gonna do something about it, we're gonna reduce focus on Facebook. This time, uh, going big was, what, was pretty difficult. We had to thread the needle very carefully. The board, they thought we were crazy. Like, why would you reduce focus on a platform where literally every everyone and their mother is there and, and focus on something that isn't even built? Kabam.com wasn't built, mobile wasn't built, Nothing was there. Going big at this stage also meant that we had to change the mindset of 400 people, 400 employees. Going big also meant we had to say goodbye to some folks who just didn't believe in the strategy and which way we were going. And going big meant that we had to do this with a ton of conviction and humility. Conviction and knowing that we were doing the right thing and a ton of humility for all of those course corrections that needed to happen along the way. As of August 2012, we had successfully moved our revenue past Facebook, equally among web as well as mobile. As you can see, in August 2012, our projected revenue for 2012 was 150 million. We closed it out at 180 million that year. And at the end of the year, our app, Kingdoms of Camelot Battle for the North, won the top grossing app for all of Apple, Apple iOS store. So at that stage, again, deciding to go big is one thing, but executing against it, committing to it, really means threading the needle carefully. So stage three, inviting the world to come in. What is it gonna look like for the future of Kabam? I actually don't know. I wish I could tell the future, <laughs> but what I can tell you is that going big will be a commitment to balancing the short and the long term, right? So any company of this scale and size, when you've gotten enough products uh, stoking that revenue flame, you have to keep on making sure those customers are happy, as well as looking to the future, right? And building what products will it be for our customers to evolve into, as well as getting new customers. Other things, there's three things as well that any company of our size that wants to control their own destiny needs to negotiate. And this is very similar to surfing, right? We have to make sure the market conditions are good. In other words, are there even waves out there in the market? Second is where are the waves happening? Is it at the place you wanna surf at? How is your industry? What does that look like? And third, and this is the one I like the most because you have the most control over it, is how are you as a company operating? When you see those waves, can you get on that surfboard and surf, right? So for any company that wants to control their own destiny, they need to be able to surf so that they can either catch that wave or say, you know what, that's not big enough for me. That's not what I want. Whatever happens to Kabam or whatever happens to us, I know that going big will have to involve a commitment to balancing the short and the long term. So what does this mean for you? What does going big mean for you? It means choosing that one thing and committing to it and not leaving until it's done. Oftentimes, people ask me, what's it like being the co-founder of Kabam? And I usually really liken it to being an Olympic athlete. Uh, what I love about watching the Sochi Olympics right now is not really the performance, but those stories, those background stories. And when you hear those stories about those athletes, it's grueling, it's hard work, a ton of commitment, setbacks and comebacks. But when they're at the top of their game, it's oh so worth it. So I ask you, what is that one thing for you guys that's oh so worth it? For some of you, it could be getting your kid into college. For others of you, it could be finishing that, that book 
or starting that new blog. And for others of you, it could be leaving that job to start that company. But whatever that one thing in is that is oh so worth it, I urge you and challenge you to commit and go big so you don't have to go home. Thank you. Oh my God, amazing. No, we're gonna stand. <laughs> oh, we're gonna we stand. have okay. time for one or two questions. You were that mind boggled, weren't you? <laughs> so I have a question. Well, you have one question, question you here. Question? I, know, I, know. I, get I always have them. Um, You're amazing. So you went big and went home, and I'm sure there were moments of terror. Like, how did you not give in to the terror? Oh, we gave in multiple times. <laughs> but I think the question is, is how do you not let it paralyze you? Yeah, right? that's a good way of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a couple things. I definitely think your co-founding team, this is why I, I'm not a firm believer of um, you're talking founders. to you're talking to a sole founder. Oh, just, no. just to give so, you some context. So um, if you do, if you are a lone founder, find a strong um, kind of advisory mentor network to really make sure that because when the when it's really down and that's really the biggest battle that you're going to have is against your own psychology. Um, and Drusen, Ben Horowitz wrote a really great blog about the psychology against that. You should you should read that. But um, if you are a lone founder, certainly find a strong mentor or advisory network. Um, and if you want to find a co-founder, that's the, one of the more positive benefits of that. that but that's really how I did it. Uh, my husband, my husband's been really awesome through it all, as well. All right, one well, more thanks. question. Do we have one more? One more. I saw a hand flicker. So. Um, if there isn't any question, I know I got this question a couple times at um, the tables I was at. So one of the questions was around building a team, and uh, we had some crazy hyper growth. And somebody, uh, a couple people, that asked like, "How did you do that with the people and the structure and all of that?" And uh, the two things that I would say that you should do—I know this is a bit tactical tip advice, but I think it's it's going to be pretty important. The first is uh, we do case studies. Um, even me personally as a hiring manager, really create a real life problem. Uh, the beauty of that is it helps them how they think as well, it helps show how they think as well as um, how they're gonna interact with your team. So I found that to be a very valuable practice. And then the second thing is um, reference checking. So make sure when you check your references to really try to grill them, and I know it's hard to bring those things out, but if you could quantify things on a scale of like one to 10 and say, okay, then why aren't they a 10 on this? Mm -hmm. Then you'll start finding more and more of those things. So um, that, that was a question that I got um, asked. That's very practical, yeah. very useful. Give me some two pieces of that. practical tips. Yeah. Holly, so much fun. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you for having me here. So special. Thank you, everybody.